Let's stand a little bit. I want us to sing. Praise if you can help me with this chorus one or two times. Let me see if we can just... Um, let's just shift the, the atmosphere here this morning a little bit. Praise is what I do When I want to be close to you I lift my hands in praise Praise is who I am Praise is who I am praises you alone are worthy to be worshipped there is no God like you you are exalted church come and open your mouth take two minutes and just give the Lord your praises you are worthy of praises mighty God you are worthy of my worship 
You're worthy of my worship. You're worthy of my thanks. And I give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, all the adoration be unto you. You alone are worthy of praise. To you be glory, mighty God. To you be praise. And to you be honor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is worthy of our praises. And I hear somebody say, no foreign God will take my place. Can take your place. No foreign God can take your place. You alone, God, are worthy of praises. Hallelujah. Shout a hallelujah and take your seats. Glory to God. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Today, we conclude on our month's focus, men embracing and uplifting, nurturing, inspiring, and transformational environment. Indeed, a call for men, men of the church, but men in general, to you know, change the way uh, that we live in general kind of isolated, segregated life where oftentimes a life where all kinds of behavior thrive and flourish in that kind of a dark life. And it's calling us to really embrace that environment where we can find upliftment, where we can be nurtured, and where we can be people of inspiration. And really for that to happen, men have to relinquish some things about us. And it's really not something that when I preach, I'm preaching about you, I'm preaching about us, because I have to think about that too. And when I heard Kevin preached in the early service this morning, and he made reference, he was sort of doing some self-disclosure, I thought to myself, how befitting that is, because the truth is, we are not given to talk about our weaknesses. We like people to feel that we have it all together, and it's not true, because they will tell you that the suicide rate among men is higher than it is among women. And they will tell you that more men are dying from conditions like heart attack and so on, Perhaps because men just do not want to uh, share, want to self-disclose, want to be vulnerable. Vulnerability is not a very good word when you're talking to men. And I don't know if we're going to change that in a month, but I hope it will at least have an impact on you to be able to reflect upon how you associate, how you, um, how you build relationships among yourselves. We struggle at this church for um, male strength. We struggle uh, for men just to respond. We, I mean, we talk a lot about it. When I mean, every men's ministry I come to and we're having a discussion, we talk about the segregation of men and we say, oh, boy, it is not good and we need to do something about it. But the same men who talk about it do absolutely nothing about it. They talk about it and it's just there. We don't do anything about it. So we, we have to, and Kevin said it this morning, if we want to change, we have to be the change that we want. I mean, it's not good for us to say we want change, but we're not willing to be a part of that change. That's a kind of hypocrisy that I personally cannot stand. We have to be a, the change that we are saying. Amen? And I believe that God wants us to change because change is meaning means we are getting better at who we are. And we should always want to be better at who we are. So turn in your Bibles to John chapter 13. We're going to look quickly at that narrative of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And we're going to quickly look at some of the lessons. Not many. I'm not going to go into it too much today because obviously I don't want to preach over my time. But um, we want to look at what can we learn from this 
activity of Jesus. So it's in John 13, verses 2 to 14, I believe I'm going to be reading. If you can put it up on the screen for me, I'd appreciate it for those persons who don't walk with their Bibles to church so that they can see the scripture. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am going to do now, or what I am doing to you, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said, No, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered and said, If I do not wash your feet, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so am I. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Lord, we thank you for your inspired word. Your word that is life and light. I pray that as the words are spoken in our hearing today, we will have revelation, illumination, and it shall challenge our hearts and challenge us towards transformation. Bless us, I pray, and bless this word and the hearers of your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we look at this, are the lessons of the text. With our theme in our mind, our theme at the back of our minds, embracing and uplifting, inspiring and transformational environment. I want for us to imagine with me very quickly what kind of environment was in the room where Jesus was. So I want for you to transport your minds into that room, that upper room where all these disciples were, 12 of them were. And just imagine what kind of environment was in the room. We know that they were there. We know that all of them were there. So think about it and we'll come back to it. Now, if we take a quick look at the text, there are some important ob observations that I'd like to make of the text. Now, Verses 2 to 4 sets the background for what Jesus was about to do. Even before that, though, in verse 1, it described the mindset of the Lord. As you read it, you can see a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions coming out from the text. So one of the things that we must learn from the text this morning is that the Lord who we serve is not a God who is void of feelings and emotions. As a matter of fact, when he came to the home of Lazarus, when Lazarus died, the Bible said he wept. And there are some theologians and Bible scholars who would put a reason to why he wept, but it just says he wept. And one of the things we know about death is that it evokes an emotion that produces tears. And so we can deduce from that, from what we know anecdotally, that he was crying because of the sufferings of the people. It could be another reason, but the text didn't say why he wept. So we can see that we're serving a God. We are the carriers, 
No, we are carrying, we are carriers of the Lord. I mean, we are, John says that he is in us and we are in him. So we carry him. And therefore, we carry the emotions, the feelings, the virtues that comes with carrying the Lord. In verse 1, it tells us, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come that he should depart from this world to the Father. Now there's a lot of feelings going on in that, in that part, just that line alone. He will depart from this world, but how? What's going to happen in another few days? I mean, he's not just looking to get away because, yes, that's going to happen. But before that, there are things that's going to happen to him. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be crucified. I mean, a lot of stuff are going to happen to him. And all of those must be going through the mind of the Lord as he is with the disciples. But he also know that he was going to be away from these persons who he has walked with for over three years. That cannot be left out of the conversation. He knew he was going to be away from these persons that he had walked with, lived with, slept in the same house, ate out of the same pot, and he was going to be away from them. So, it's, and the word continues, having loved his own who were, were in the world, he loved them to the very end. It is, the, it is what I want for us to have in our minds that... We are talking about a God who is demonstrating to people that he loves them, who is demonstrating to these 12 men that he loved them. And the text, John, I believe, writing here, would be perhaps the best person to describe it because John pretty much described himself as a disciple who Jesus loved or the beloved of the master. And so he perhaps would be a good person to describe the kind of sentimental feelings that Jesus would have had and expressed at this moment. That kind of a mixed emotion that he was experiencing in this moment. So one could say that Jesus was somewhat reflective and contemplative. And he, as he approached this event and as he sat with his, what I call his cabinet. Now, so when we look at the room, remember I asked you to look at the room. Are you looking at the room? Look at the room. You may not, all of you know the 12 disciples, but you can read upon their lives and you will discover their different nuances. But a quick glance of Jesus' executive, we will see Thomas the doubter. And Thomas we know doubted later, but it would not have been a behavior that he developed at that point, it would have been something that he would have been practicing to doubt all along. So Thomas, we know, was a doubter. Then, of course, we would have seen Peter, and, you know, Peter is a prominent disciple, but here Peter is the denier, the one who later on would deny Christ. He said to the Lord, I will die for you, I will die with you. But when the rubber met the road, he said, I didn't know him. So we have Thomas the doubter, we have Peter the denier. Who else do we have there? We have also James and John. And they had in them a kind of attitude like some of us. They wanted to sit on the right hand and on the left hand of Jesus. They, that was their concern. Uh, which one of us can, you be, can we be allowed? The mother of them, which some people feel that they were the ones who encouraged their mother to go to Jesus and ask Jesus to let one of them sit on his right hand and one on his left hand. And Jesus asked, are they willing to pay the price to do that? So we have them as well. But we also had Judas. Judas, the one who would betray the Lord. Judas, the one who would literally sold him out. He was also in the room. So when you look at the room, when you read the room, you see all kinds of different personalities. And I don't have time to go into all of the others. But John tells us in the text that despite all of those different personalities that existed there, Jesus loved them. Despite Judas being the betrayer, and I mean, I'm going ahead of myself, but Jesus, Judas being the betrayer, betrayer, 
Jesus loved him. And as a matter of fact, when Judas came to betray Jesus, Jesus said, you know the word that Jesus used to greet him? Friend. So Jesus knew all of these things. I think that one of the lessons we can learn as we dig a little into this, this, this context here is the superior love that the Christian man needs to possess. It cannot be a love that is just an ordinary kind of love. It has to be a kind of agape love, a God love that will make you be able to accept even those and love them who would be your detractors. So when you look at the picture, in my observation, it is not a very impressive picture. I mean, we would not take some of these people in our church. We would perhaps run them out. We would, you know, Peter perhaps would not thrive in our churches today because we wouldn't want that kind of character among us. But Jesus loved Peter. He loved Judas. He loved James and John. He loved all of the disciples. So as you keep this scene or this kind of environment in the back of your minds, let us move forward now to the example of leadership the example of servanthood, the example of love that the Lord displayed, which we know as a washing of the disciples' feet. Now, a little bit of history here is that this act of feet washing started in the Old Testament. We see it happening from as early in Genesis 18, and it has traversed the Old Testament. And the idea here was that the, when you traveled, because in those days, they didn't wear shoes like we wear today, and they didn't drive automobiles like we drive today. So they would be walking in sandals. So when they get to the home, where they, wherever they were going, their feet would be dirty. And so in some households, where it would be poorer households, they would provide water for the guests to wash his or her own feet. But in the more um, in the higher echelon, they would provide an, a servant to wash the feet of the guests. So the disciples would have had this context in the back of their mind that this is what the washing of feet really is about. It's about a servant washing the feet. And in fact, that was the lowest position within the household. The washing of the saints, the washing of the feet was the lowest position in the household. So you can imagine with me now the, what is going through the minds of the disciples, certainly through the mind of Peter, when he recognized that this is what Jesus was about to do. When he recognized Jesus taking a towel, taking a basin, taking a pitcher of water, and now is going to be washing the feet of the disciples. Now, you have to understand that the disciples would have to know. They may not know as much as Jesus knew about each other, but they lived together practically for three years, so they would have known each other. I'm sure they would have had conflict. I'm sure they would have known what some of the wrong attitude and bad attitudes are among themselves. And Peter knew that, I believe. And so you see Peter's response, Peter's retorting and saying, you will not wash my feet. And the text didn't say that, but I think it is safe for me to say that Peter's attitude was on display. Because later on, you'll find Peter in the book of Acts being a prejudicial kind of a person, somebody who didn't want to associate himself with certain class of people. And so Peter's true color was coming out in that place, and God wanted that to happen. And I believe Peter might have been guided by that feeling, maybe a feeling of superiority or something, where if Jesus did that, then he might require me to do it. So the first thing is not to allow it to be done to me. You know, and, and we're very good at that. We're very good at making excuses. We're very good at pretending that something is happening when it is really not happening, when we are not participating in it. We are very good at showing, at creating a show when the real issue is we are not a part of what is happening. 
but we create an impression, Brother Duane, in people's mind that we are a part of it. That is a devilish spirit that we should never embrace. Amen. So the disciples would, at least Peter, would not have it. By washing the feet of these men of varying types, varying characteristics, varying personalities, knowing what is in their hearts, knowing what is in their hearts, I wonder what Jesus was seeking to accomplish. They were already in the house, so he could not be washing their feet simply because their feet were dirty. I don't think that would be it. They were already in the house. I don't know if they had washed their feet. I don't know what happened when they entered. But it has to be much deeper than that. And I want to, I want to perhaps present two ideas. Number one, to me, he was demonstrating his love for his disciples. Listen to this. Despite knowing what is in their hearts. He wanted them to know that despite what is in your hearts, I am displaying my love for you. I believe the Bible said that we are to love without hypocrisy. And Jesus wanted them to recognize that he loved them despite what was in their hearts. And Jesus knew what was in their hearts. For he said, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. By washing their feet, Jesus confronted their indifferences, which would in my mind include A, the feelings or feelings of what seems to me to be a kind of superiority complex, as we see in the behavior of John and James with their unholy request to sit on the right hand and left hand of Jesus. So I believe Jesus was confronting that kind of attitude. And I want to recognize that when we find ourselves unable to do something that is expected of us, the best way to get ourselves doing it is to simply start to do it. So we might say, you know, I find it difficult to speak to somebody. If we walk around every day saying we find it difficult to talk to somebody, we would never talk to somebody. What you need to do is start. Amen? That's what needs to happen. We need to start. So we need to get rid of this superiority complex that some of us have to think, well, I could talk to somebody so and so, but I don't. I mean, some people will even say, some of you men will even say, I would talk to somebody, but I see nobody in 41 to speak to. I mean, can you imagine that even forming the mind of any member of this congregation? You would have to be mad. You would have to be crazy. There has to be somebody unless it's not the church. God will not have a church where there are no persons there who can help the individuals to go through their situation. So nobody should say that with, any, with a straight face. If you think that it's because you are battling, battling with a superiority mindset, you think you are better than everybody else. And if you think you're better than anybody else, the only recourse to that is to repent. Because all of us in this room, every single one of us, whether we are doctors, lawyers, police, soldiers, know nothing at all, we are all God's children. Amen. And nobody is better than anybody. Some of us, Brother Dwayne, may be more talented. Some of us may be more educated, have more money, have this and have that, but we are all brothers and sisters. Say amen, church. And we must not embrace a mindset and a culture that makes us feel that we are better than anybody else. I rebuke that spirit out of you now in the name of Jesus. Humble yourself.
I don't like to talk about myself, and everybody knows that. But I am the pastor of the church. And I have no feeling of better than anybody else. There is nobody who is in the church that I will not serve, I will not attend to, I will not care for because of their status. As a matter of fact, those who are weakest and more vulnerable and look puny, puny, and everybody turn against them are the ones that my heart reaches out to even more because sometimes nobody talks to these people. Nobody embraces them. Even when we are to pray and hold hands, some people don't even hold their hands because you think you have a superiority about you. You are wrong. Amen. Amen. We must love our brothers. We must love each other. Amen, church. So, he could be addressing Peter's self-indulgence when he rejected Jesus' demand to wash his feet. Or he could be confronting Judas' deceptive character, which was demonstrated by his betrayal. But whatever Jesus was doing, he was doing it because he wanted transformation. He was doing it because he wanted them to change. He wanted them to see him. He said, you call me teacher and master, teacher and Lord, and you are right when you say that. And he said, I, your Lord, I, your master, I, your teacher, here am I. I'm going to wash your feet because I want you to understand that it's not about how high you sit, it's about how low you can get. And if you follow what's going on in church these days, the church becomes a society movement where some people feel that they are not welcomed. I want to make an announcement. Everybody is welcome in this place. You don't have to have anything to be welcome. You just come as you are and we welcome you. Another lesson that Jesus was teaching, I believe, was that interpersonal relationship of the church or what interpersonal relationship of the church should look like. You know, for years, well, for months, you've heard me said that I have detected a spirit and a culture of indifference among us. We, and it affects, Brother Duane, everything we do. It affects everything we do. When you look, for instance, at the early church, the early church was a congregation of people who were evidently together. They were together. They did what was expected of them. They coalesced around a vision so that when the disciples, after the healing of the lame man, when they, in, in Acts chapter 3, when they were warned not to preach in the name of Jesus anymore, they went to the church, they went to the community, and they told them what happened. And the church, because they saw the mission of the church under threat, it was not their life that was under threat. It was the mission of the church that was under threat. It was God's mission that was under threat. The Bible said they got together and when they prayed, the place where they were gathered praying was shaken. The intensity, the fervency, that which captured their imagination, that which ruled their attitude at that time was so intense, my brothers and sisters, that it caused the very place where they were to shake. How many times God has called us to something in this local church and so many of us pay no regards to what God is saying and we pay no attention to it. It is a spirit of indifference that we need to deal with. I don't have to do something because I feel like doing it. Many Sunday mornings, Sister Dahlia, I don't feel to come up here and preach, but I can't go by my feelings. 
I go by what is my responsibility. I go by what God expects of me. I want to tell somebody that what you're feeling is not necessarily about God because God doesn't work with our feeling. It is what you are convicted about. That is where you need to make your decision. And so many of us lose our conviction because we are situated in our feelings. And God can't speak to us because our feelings rule. So the interpersonal relationship of the church. If washing of the feet is the lowest, most menial task of the household, and the Lord does it, I want this congregation to ask yourself, what is there that I am not willing and able to do? If the Lord took off his garment, took off his robe, took off his, 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 his clothes, and got down to that place, then what is it that God is expecting of us that is too hard to do so that the right environment can be created for God's work to be manifested? I want for you to look quickly. What is there that we cannot do in service to our Lord? So note this, A. For you to wash the feet of the individual, you more than likely have to stoop. You more than likely have to stoop. You can't stand up and wash somebody's foot unless they are elevated on a platform. And I don't think that's what happened here. So when, when you see, so what is the image that is in my mind? Imagine with me the Lord stooping down in front of Judas. I want you to imagine it with me. And imagine Judas sitting down and allow the Lord to wash his feet and then turn around. And betray him. That stooping down alone, Sister Morgan, should be enough for Judas to say, No man, when am I heart no right about this man? But do you know that when people make up their minds about you, you there's almost nothing that you can do to convince them that what they have in their mind is not true. I learned that long ago. I learned that long ago. So if, if you come to me and I say to you, this is the situation and you don't believe it is your business. But I am not going to try to convince you because I won't be able to convince you that what I have said is, is, is the truth. Are you hearing me? So I'm not going to swear and tell you, say, no, me never do it. Me, me never, me I swear me never do it. You'll never hear that from me. My response is simple, no. You want to believe it, Dwayne? You believe it. If you don't want to believe it, it's your business. I'm done. Because when people believe certain things about you, they will not change their belief. So don't try to convince them. Just do what you know is right. Jesus could have said to Judas in that moment when he was washing his foot, Jesus could have said, So Judas, you really are going to do that thing there? He could have a one on one moment in Odwin. So Judas, you really are going to continue after, after all of this? But it was left up to Judas' conscience because everybody has a conscience. And you know what is right and you know what is wrong. Nobody has to tell you that. You know it. But some of us have done the wrong so long that it becomes right. I wish the Lord would trouble us today. I want God to trouble us. The B, he had to touch them and handle them. He had to touch them. You can't wash somebody's feet 
I mean, I know there are all some modern inventions now and so on. You can wash a car, just drive your car through something or another. You wash the car. I don't know if you can wash it good. I've never done it. I don't know if you have it in Jamaica. And they have all kinds of new technology and so on. But no new technology, not in the church, that would cause you to wash the feet of your brother without you touching and handling it. And some of the men's feet, not easy to wash. Because some of them have not seen. Help me now, somebody. What are the word be looking for, Sister Morgan? What is the word, deaconess? Have not seen pedicure. Me never say it. Deaconess. But really, men, you know you can go and get your feet. And it, I mean, it really feels good, to be honest. But sometimes when you look at some men's feet, this is a dealer, and I mean, not all um, flip-flop. May I tell you, them two, not pretty. Anyway, I digress. But I'm making a point that it is not going to be always nice and feeling smooth in our hands. But it's all a part of showing love. It's all a part of showing dedication. It's all a show, part of showing care. We need to care about each other. Amen. We need to care about each other. Men, when you hear and know of crisis that your brothers are in, don't just kneel at your bedside and pray for them. Talk to them. Go visit them. Show up where they are and show them that you care and that you love them and that they are not alone. And some of you men must stop behaving like you're an island. Your heart a tear out. And people ask you, how are you? Be good. Lie. Lie. Because when you done, you go home and you're miserable, you can tank a you, 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 you just you're cold and the picnic them, I get it, and the wife, I get it, and everybody, I get it because you're just miserable and can tank a because talk to somebody, man. Get some help. Reach out for help. We are in the body of Christ to help one another when we are going through crisis. Say amen, church. Amen. Then the third thing, for him to wash their feet, he had to connect with them. He had to connect with them. How many of us as men feel disconnected? Disconnected from our church, disconnected from our families, disconnected from our jobs, disconnected from our gifts and talents, disconnected by so many different things. Going through the motion, but disconnected. Going through the motion, but feeling no sense of community because we're disconnected. Let me tell you something. When certain things happen in your life, in our life, don't, don't play it. It has significant impact upon our emotions. It will make us go through the valley of the shadow of death. It will make us want to lock up in our houses and hide. It will put us in depression because we are humans. Amen. Now, I'm not suggesting that anybody should go and stay in depression, but I'm suggesting that because of our humanity, we are prone to these things. And we should not hear, listen to me now, women. Don't, don't turn your men into superheroes. Don't belittle their feelings and their emotions. Don't, don't, 
when you see the man I go through crisis, nobody criticize and say, so you are crying for that, me never know, so I'm married to a little girl. Because some of you women have some things to say out of your mouth to your men, the men in your life, and you wonder where you get those words from. You too need to repent. When you finish with the man, the man feel like he would have just go in one canal, go lay down and make water wash him away. Amen. I'm speaking the truth. And then when you come at church, now you're in a spirit. You leave the man at home depressed. All right. You can't stay home here with your wicked self. Stay home here with your worldly self. Me go to church, can't worship. I don't know who you're worshiping, but it's not God. So what's the point I'm making? The point I'm making here is that our Lord sets a very high standard of love, of dedication, of service, and of community. We must aspire to that same standard. I am not suggesting what we start it tomorrow, doing. I am suggesting that we start it today. I want our men to make a commitment that I am going to change my behavior today in this place. I'm not going to ask you for showing your hand or anything like that. I'm just saying to you, make the commitment to yourself. Make it to yourself and make it to your God that the attitude that I have embraced over my life that has brought me to this place, I am going to begin today to rid myself of it because it has not helped me. There are some of you who would be greater than who you are now. You'd be doing more than what you are doing now. Some of you wouldn't have the regrets that you have now if you had done this long ago. And some of you are looking towards the end of your life and you are looking back and you are asking yourself, what have I accomplished? Because you have sat in that place for so long and the enemy have, has robbed you of your gifts, your talents, and your abilities. But I want to say to you that if you will trust God's grace today, if you will say, God, I am surrendering to you today. God, I am changing today. I believe that God who is merciful, God who is mighty, God who is well able will restore you. Because that's what God does. He's a restorer. So he will. He will restore you. But you have to make a decision. You have to make a decision. That I have had enough of this way of life. It hasn't helped me. And I'm going to make a change. Stand everybody.